Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Well, good morning, church. It's so lovely to be with you this morning. So great to have some folks in as we uh, get ready to ramp up for July the 5th. It's going to be very, very exciting when we can uh, pack the place out, uh, allowing for the restrictions, of course. Looking forward to you being able to join back with us and uh, looking forward to having some folks in the terrace. And we're looking forward to having some folks over in the cafe as well as we worship the Lord in our 9, 11 and 6 p.m. services. And uh, today we're going to continue our series, Hallowed Be Thy Name, as we continue to remember the wonderful names of God and how they speak to us in our lives. And Jason and the team, thank you so much for that beautiful song as we remember that God is the one who fights our battles for us and God is the one who has won the victory for us. And uh, that's great news to know because really that speaks about the name that I want to look at today. Pastor Timon and Graham have taken us through a series of God's beautiful names and how they speak to our situation. We've looked at Yahweh, the self-existent one. We've looked at my shepherd, the one who leads and protects us. And what a beautiful picture that was. The almighty God, the one who can make the way when no one else can make a way, the almighty God can God everlasting, the one who holds our future in his hands. And how these beautiful, beautiful names speak so relevantly to our lives today as we need to hear about God's character and how that impacts the situations of our lives. How beautiful to know that God holds our future in his hands. Amen. How beautiful it is to know that our God is the self-existent one. How beautiful it is to know that our God is a shepherd. And today I want to take you for a moment through that beautiful name, El Gabor, the mighty God. And El Gabor, the mighty God, really speaks about him being a warrior. It brings out the aspect of our God who fights on our behalf. There's a man by the name of Keith Payne, still alive today. And up on your screens for you is a photo of Keith when he was in the Vietnam War. He fought in a number of theatres of war and when he arrived in Vietnam, he was a a seasoned warrior. He went to Vietnam as a trainer and uh, during his time in Vietnam, Keith and the troops that he was training uh, were engaged in a battle and they were surrounded on three sides and in dire straits. Many of his troops were wounded, they were in disarray. And as they began to fall back, the enemy continued to pepper them with bullets and uh, move on their position. And during the night time, even though they were suffering terribly, and Keith himself by this stage was wounded both in the hands and in the arms, he went back under enemy fire, basically back into their range, to rescue men, his men who had fallen and were injured. And during the course of the night, even as he feared for his own life, and he spoke very, very candidly about this on Anzac Day, there were times where he was just terrified. He recounts one time when he had been, went forward again to recover one of the lost soldiers and brought them back. He was resting behind a log. He had a smoke. He realised that to go again and look for more would very likely cost him his life. He said goodbye to his wife and his children. Drew up the courage that he needed to get out from behind that log and go and look for other men. And during the course of that night and over the hours that come ahead, he rescued over 40 men. Amazing. And uh, they were able to regather. He goes on to tell that he expected the next morning to be completely overrun by the enemy. So seasoned was he in war, he recognised that the leader that he was fighting against, if it was him, he would have advanced in the morning, recognising that the troops were weak. And yet he did not do it for some reason. Inexplicably, the enemy did not advance. And Keith was able to gather his troops together and they were able to survive that campaign. And for that gallantry that Keith showed, he was given the Victoria Cross An incredibly honourable thing to have, the Victoria Cross, a a rare award to receive, an award given for those who show great courage under fire, for those who willingly risk their life for the sake of others. And really, this 
highlights what I want to touch on today, and that is El Gabor, a great warrior. Our God is pictured in the Scriptures as a a great warrior who fights the battle for us, who's shown great gallantry, who's shown great courage, and who has done what only God himself can do. Isaiah 10.21 picks this up beautifully. It's on your screens for you. And this is uh, in the Hebrew, mighty God. The mighty God is El Gabor. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, the mighty God, El Gabor. And this is speaking about Jehovah, the Father, and speaking about the fact that he is the mighty God who fights our battles for us. And we don't have to take too much time in the Old Testament to see just how mighty our God is. But I do want you to come with me in your Bibles. If you have a Bible with you, or if there's one in the pew in front of you, if you've got one at home, I want you to take your Bibles and just momentarily come with me. And let's have a look at uh, Daniel, uh, sorry, Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. And as you're turning in your Bibles, I want to further define for you in a biblical sense and literally what the word El Gabor means, and this will be up on your screens for you, the word designated for the expected Messiah, which which we're going to touch on in a moment when we come back to Isaiah 9 and verse 6, is from the word, the root word, uh, Geba. It is usually translated mighty God, mighty God, but more exactly, it's a powerful champion, a, a godly hero. And I like this last part. The word Gabor means strong or mighty. And it refers to someone who is bold and audacious. I love that word. Strong or valiant. The word audacious means somebody who willingly and surprisingly is able to defend others. Who goes out and does something unexpected and surprising. I think that's a beautiful definition for God our Father as he has done this audacious act on our behalf and for the nation of Israel, as we'll see in this beautiful prayer in God's word, he has acted audaciously. Have a look at Nehemiah's prayer. Come into chapter 9, page 489 in your Bibles. Have a look with me at verse 6 just for a moment. Then we're going to come over into Psalm 136. Verse 6, he says, You are the Lord, you alone, you made heaven, the heavens, and all, that, and all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. The hosts of heaven worship you, he says in verse 6. And so Nehemiah, as he's worshipping the Lord, even though he's suffering himself, as he's worshipping the Lord, he remembers that as God is the one who has made the heavens and the earth. It is El Gabor, the mighty God. And we know that he's El Gabor, the mighty God, because of the mighty works he has done. Who else could create the heavens and the earth? And then in verse 7, he prays this. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. He's recounting in his prayer that El Gabor, the mighty God, is the one who called Abram out of, out of his land, And he gave him the name Abraham and he made him the father of the nation of Israel. And through Abraham and through the blessing that God poured out on him, that blessing is still poured out on us today. You come a bit further down in the book of Nehemiah. And I think I said Daniel about five times then, but I meant Nehemiah. Come down to verse 9. And we see this. And you saw the affliction of the fathers in Egypt and you heard their cry at the Red Sea and you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants of the people in the land or in his hand. And again, we see Nehemiah recounting that it was El Gabor, the mighty God, who delivered the nation of Israel out of Egypt and continued to be faithful to the promise that he had made to Abraham. Our God is a a mighty God, a mighty, mighty God. Come down in this beautiful prayer, come down to verse 15. As he recounts, as Nehemiah says, You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And again, he shows that the mighty God was able to feed the nation of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. The mighty God brought them bread from heaven and as the rock poured forth water for their thirst. Who else could do this but the mighty God? 
El Gabor. Come over with me for a moment. Uh, or come down further, just before we go into Psalm 30. Come over and have a look at verse 12 as we close this beautiful prayer of Nehemiah out. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty and the awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love. The El Gabor of the Old Testament, Jehovah is one who keeps his promises. Isn't that an awesome thing to know? In a world that is so fickle, with leaders that say one thing and do another thing. The God, the God of the Bible, El Gabor, the mighty God, when he speaks, he follows through. What he says is what he does. And he does not turn away from any of the promises that he has made to the nation of Israel. And that the application is for us today, nor will he turn away from the promises that he has made to us. This mighty God, El Gabor. Now come with me in your Bibles to... Psalm 136, this beautiful, beautiful prayer, a lengthy prayer where the psalmist cries out to God and talks about his everlasting love. And I'm not going to read all of it. All I want to do is touch on the latter part of it. I want to touch on verses 4 and through, but I don't want to read each time the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever for the sake of time. But just listen to the rhythm of the character of El Gabor. Listen to what the mighty God does. Listen to his wonderful works. To him alone, verse 4, to him alone do, he does great wonders. Verse 5, to him who has understanding, has made the heavens and the earth. Verse 6, to him who spreads out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights, the sun to rule over the day and the moon to rule over the night, to him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, to him who divided the Red Sea into two, to him who made Israel pass through its midst, to him who overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea, to him who led his people through the wilderness, to him who struck down the great kings and killed the mighty kings. To him, it is he who remembered us in our lower state. Isn't that just gorgeous? This awesome and fierce God whom none can withstand and who has struck down those who oppose his people, who has brought to pass his plan, who has fulfilled his faithful promises to the nation of Israel. And then in tenderness in verse 23, it is he who remembered us in our low estate. Our God is a gracious God. I often think of God in terms of an inexplicable, majestic giant. And he tips toes through our lives like a giant tiptoeing through the lilies. And not one does get crushed. Not one is broken as he majestically moves his way through our lives and remembers all the things that we go through. It says in verse 24, And rescued us from our foes who gives us food for all of our flesh. This is the mighty God, El Gabor. Amen? Isn't it wonderful to know that he is on our side, that he fights our battles? These beautiful, beautiful psalms. Well, now come back with me because we want to connect the dots. Because in Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 21, we saw that El Gabor, the mighty God, Jehovah, fights the battles for us. But if we take a step back, we see this beautiful, beautiful verse, verse 6, chapter 9 of the book of Isaiah, which was read so beautifully for us this morning. I've been enjoying that. And thank you very much, Phil and family. That's just beautiful. Isaiah 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. And then what does it say? The underline is mine. Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And this passage, as we well know, is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the child that was born. As the nation of Israel is in bondage, as the nation of Israel is being overthrown and suffering, as the nation of Israel is in desperate need of God to intervene for them, El Gabor, his answer to their need is a child. And we know that this is a messianic passage that speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the answer to the world's problem, the answer to our sin, the answer to our brokenness is a child. And this child's name that has been given to us is El Gabor, the mighty God. Isn't that awesome? And we cannot miss that because just a few of chapter along, we see that El Gabor is used of God himself, Jehovah. And in the chapter before that, the same word is used for Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, our wonderful, wonderful saviour. So let's have a look for a moment at El Gabor, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the wonderful works that he alone can do. Those surprising, audacious acts of the Lord Jesus Christ that reveal the fact that he is not just a babe in the manger, but in fact he is mighty God. El Gabor in our lives. Matthew chapter 4, we read in the verses 23 and 24 these words. As Jesus is ministering to the crowd, and he went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing the diseases and afflictions of the people. And so his, his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all of the sick, the afflicted with various diseases, pains, those oppressed with demons and having seizures, all those who needed to be healed. And we don't have enough of, it says that, that we could not write enough books to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. But we know as we do a quick scan of the New Testament, our Lord Jesus Christ healed as many as physically was possible in his human form. And many, many more than we learn about in the scriptures. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 3 where Jesus healed the leper? Now, leprosy today for some of us is not such a big deal. There, there are, we have found some cures for some leprosy. But in Jesus' day, leprosy was a death sentence. And Jesus did not stand off at a distance and say, I hope it all works out for you. No, Jesus, El Gabor, the mighty God, drew near and touched them and brought healing to their lives. And people were astonished that this audacious God would do this thing would do this thing that the world said could not be done. The world had said that they are unclean and we need to put them away and we need to keep distance from them. But El Gabor said, no, I will do this audacious thing. I will step into their lives and I will touch them and I'll bring healing to them. Praise God. In the latter part of Matthew, do you remember the centurion's servant? The centurion comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and says, my servant is sick. Would you come quickly and heal? Jesus said he would come, and then the, I'm sorry, and then the centurion uh, said, don't come to my home. Just say a word. Just say a word, Lord Jesus, and he will be healed. And so it was that the centurion's servant was healed as the Lord Jesus Christ spoke a word. Who else could do that? These are the audacious acts of God. And then later on in the same passage, we see that Peter's mother-in-law was healed. What a miracle that Peter's mother-in-law was healed. Some of us would like that, to see our mother-in-law's healed. <laughs> not mine, not mine. My, my mother-in-law, she's my mother-in-law. There were those, if you go on further in the book of Matthew, that were suffered from demon affliction. And it's so easy to say somebody being demon afflicted, we... We probably don't get the import of that, but these people's lives were utterly trashed by this. They were excluded from community. They were excluded from worship. They did not have control of themselves. Their families grieved as they tried to care for them. And then El Gabor arrives on the scene. And with a word and with a touch, the demons were cast out and the people were healed. The audacious acts of God. There's even a story later on in the book of Matthew as we see one who touched his very robe, did not speak to him because they were too shy, did not take up any of his time, did not ask a question, but simply pressed through the crowd and touched the robe of El Gabor. And through that very touch, that person was healed. The mighty acts of God. There is none like the Lord Jesus Christ, our mighty God, El Gabor. 
how powerful he is. Do you remember Jairus' daughter raised from the dead? Not raised from the sleep or raised from a slumber, but having lost their precious child. And who could heal them? Only the Lord Jesus Christ as he raised them up from the dead. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has power over life and death and is able to forgive our sins. Because he is God in the flesh, El Gabor. In the Septuagint, a Greek version of the Old Testament in the writings of that, in Zephaniah, the word that is translated there for mighty God is the same word that's used in Luke chapter 1, 49. Same Greek word. And have a listen to this because when you go to Luke chapter 1 and verse 49, we're talking about Mary and the mother of Jesus and Mary's prayer. And she says this in her prayer, For he who is mighty has done great things for me. El Gabor, the mighty God. Is that not true? That a virgin, a young woman who did not, who had not defiled herself, who had not had a husband. She was a, a young godly woman and the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and she was uh, conceived a child, the Lord Jesus Christ. This the beautiful, godly and holy act. Who else could do this but the mighty God himself, El Gabor? This is the mighty God who fights on our behalf. So how has God fought for you and I? How has the Lord Jesus Christ fought the battle for us in our lives? Let's have a, a think about that for a little moment. Let's go as we begin. I want to take you just through a few more verses as we think about the mighty God. Come with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. If you haven't got a Bible, it's okay. It will be up on the screen for you. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Have a look at the Lord Jesus Christ, El Gabor, the mighty God, fighting on our behalf, fighting the, the greatest enemy of our souls, sin and death and Satan. And it says here in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. The Lord Jesus Christ's mightiest act, the mightiest act that he ever did on our behalf as a mighty warrior, this audacious act of dying an innocent man, dying on the cross for us. And then on the third day, he rose up again. And as the Lord Jesus Christ died, the spiritual battle that was going on in the heavens, the spiritual battle for our souls was raging in the heavens. And he had the victory on our behalf. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. And he made a, an open shame of them, triumphing over them. This is our El Gabor. He did this on our behalf when we were utterly defenseless. Because let's be clear. The Bible tells us that all of us have sinned. And all of us have fallen short of God's standard. And the penalty for that is spiritual death. And there was no one in this room, no one watching this broadcast, no human being apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, who was able to pay the price that was needed so that we could be free from that penalty that we so willingly deserve. Jesus Christ did this audacious act of presenting himself as the spotless lamb of God and dying in our place. Isn't that awesome? How majestic, how powerful, how wonderful the acts of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would do that on our behalf. And defeat the greatest enemy, sin and death. Have a look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This will resonate in your heart. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, this can actually be your song if you humble yourself before him and invite him to be your Lord and Saviour. If you believe upon him, as the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 55 to 57 says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory over this through the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the people said, Amen. This is just the wonderful news. The, the warrior, 
the, the Holy One of God, the Holy Hero of God, the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh has fought the greatest battle of all on our behalf and He has defeated sin and death and He has been able to set us free through dying and raising Himself from the dead. And so now we can sing confidently because of what He's done in our lives. Oh death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? You don't have it anymore. Because now that I'm in Christ and Christ is in me, I will be raised up as he is. First Peter chapter 2. If you'll come there in your Bibles. And verse 24 says this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. This is an awesome act of God. On our behalf, the Lord Jesus Christ, El Gabor, willingly went to the cross and bore our sins upon his body. As he hung there, he bore our sins upon his body. That we might be the righteousness of God. He bore Jeff Littlefair's sin. He bore your sin. He bore all of your sin upon the cross. And he died on that cross. And the Romans came and they speared his side and water came out. They did not have to break his knees. They took him down off the cross and they put him in a tomb and they sealed that tomb. Jesus was dead. And then on the third day, this wonderful miracle happened. As God the Father, El Gabor, Jehovah, and God the Son, through their power, raised Jesus from the dead. He gave up his life and he was able to take up his life from the grave and be, he was raised from the dead for our behalf. And so now we who were sinners, if we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, he is prepared to give us his righteousness so that when God looks at us, he does not see us as sinners condemned as we deserve to be. He sees us through the blood of Christ as though we were the children of God, righteous before him. And this battle for our souls, was fought and won by the mighty El Gabor. While we were completely incapable of defending ourselves, while we were wounded in battle, unable to save ourselves, about to be overrun by the enemy, El Gabor came through and rescued us. Praise God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Arthur Payne, uh, Sir Keith Payne, is enjoying a... Uh, a life now where he's actually continuing to fight the battle for veterans who return from war, suffering stress, depression and anxiety through the conflict that they have seen. And who better to understand them in their suffering than a man who went through exactly the same thing himself. When he returned from battle, he suffered stress and anxiety and depression and really fought another battle. Another battle that Thankfully, he has had victory over and now is able to help other veterans, other heroes work their way through these heartaches. The Word of God tells us that Jesus Christ understands us perfectly. He's fully acquainted with the suffering that we have been through. He lived a life as we have lived. He was fully human. He felt the pain. He felt the suffering. He felt the temptation. But unlike us, he did not fail. He was victorious, a mighty warrior. God in the flesh. He fought the battle on our behalf. This is the mighty El Gabor of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. So what are you facing today? As a congregation, as a community, what are we facing today where we need El Gabor to fight on our behalf? What is it that you're going through as a family? What is it that you're going through in your marriage? What is it you're going through in your finances, in your workplace, where you need El Gabor to fight the battle on your behalf? Because that's exactly where God wants us to be. He wants us to lay down our pride. He wants us to lay down our brokenness. He wants us to lay down our envy. He wants us to lay down our hatred. He wants us to humbly come before him and invite him into every situation of our lives that he might fight the battle on our behalf. Don't we need to hear that? It, the, everything that we face, we need El Gabor. We need to humble ourselves before the mighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and invite him into our lives. And we can do that right now.
I want you to bow with me in prayer if you would. And let's invite El Gabor into our situation. And maybe for some of you, you're going to invite him into your life for the first time. And I'd just like you to pray along with me. So please, wherever you might be, whether some of you are here or the majority of you are watching us online, would you be so kind as to bow your heads and pray along with me? Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the El Gabor, mighty God, the hero warrior who has fought sin and death on our behalf. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for willingly giving up your life for me. Thank you for going to the cross to bear my sin. Thank you for dying in my place. But I've got to say with all of my heart, thank you for the power that you have to raise yourself from the dead. Thank you for the power that you have to forgive me of my sin. And I confess my sin to you. I confess to you that I've been trying to live my life my own way. I've been trying to fight my own battles. And I have been losing it every time. And I humble myself before you now and I invite you in to my life. I invite you into my workplace. I invite you into my home. I invite you into all of my life to fight on my behalf, to glorify yourself in my life. And I thank you for your love to me in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and God bless.